Okay, this is um, Dr. Morton, and this is DSD 3563 um, for Wednesday, the 4th of November. And uh, so uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to cover what's basically set up for the 11th, which is uh, 10, uh, which is kind of some extra stuff, actually. Um, so, yeah, so that's what we're doing. And No, sorry, 11. Uh, 11 is the extra stuff. We've already covered 10 and 9, so we're pretty much caught up. Uh, I will review on Friday. I will review on Monday. I will review on Wednesday, and we'll have the test on Friday. I haven't written the test yet, but what I'm thinking about doing is uh, giving you some questions on carry look ahead and carry propagate adders compared to carry ripple adders. So you might um, you might go back and look at the text in that information. Uh, but you also might just Google some of that on the internet and look at uh, some of the various Verilog files that are out there, and uh, and see if you can make uh, see if you can understand how the carry look ahead and the carry propagate adders work. Um, and uh, so because uh, it's interesting, and it's also interesting when you look at some of the code out there, you realize that uh, that uh, not all of it is actually uh, correct. <laughs> Interestingly enough, all right. So that's what we're that's what we're gonna do. It'll probably what I'll do is give you uh, give you a page of code, um, and then I'm gonna ask you 20 questions about it. Basically, that's kind of what I'm thinking. Or I may give you a couple of pages and ask you, you know, 10 or 15 questions about one, 10 or 15 about the other. Uh, I'm not gonna actually force you to write code, but I'm I'm gonna try and avoid just. Uh, general questions I'm going to try and ask specific questions about a piece of code um, so that's what I'm thinking and that'll be a week from this Friday so that's the 13th okay um, again just to review you only have you, uh, you should by the end of this week you should be done with all the labs and you should be working on your project uh, I'd like you to let me know what project you're going to do I went over that uh, in the lecture for um, Monday so make sure you review that if you didn't. Um, all right. With that, we will um, move along here. I think I'll shrink this down a little. Well, maybe I, maybe I don't even need to. Maybe that's good right there. OK, so registers and nets. So uh, so this is, this is certainly a topic that's important. Uh, we've already covered it. I'm just going to add a few points and kind of review some of the things you should already know about this. Uh, so we'll talk about register types, uses, and restrictions. We'll talk about net types, uses, and restrictions, and some examples. Um, OK, so there are only, in, in Verilog, there are only two families of data types. That's it. Nets, which basically act like physical wires, and they connect stuff. And registers, which act like variables in a normal computer language, and they actually store things. Uh, not all data types are useful in synthesis. Some synthesis uh, doesn't use certain data types. Um, so the register types are register, integer, real, real time, and time. OK, so, so register, per se, is uh, so it's an abstraction of a hardware storage element. Think flip-flop. Um, it doesn't correspond directly to physical memory. Uh, so in general, it's going to be made up of flip-flops. But, well, it has, a, it, has a, it has a default value of unknown as opposed to disconnected or high Z. So registers are never high Z. They're, because they, they will have a value. It's 0 or 1, and, uh, and it'll be outputting that value. We may not know what that value is, in which case it, it'll be listed as unknown or X, or uninitialized or X, but it won't be listed as disconnected. Disconnected is kind of reserved for wires, which makes sense, right? But registers output something. They, they aren't nothing. Um, and, uh, and they're unsigned. The default size of a register is one bit, but obviously oftentimes we'll define them as vectors. And the way you get a register assigned a value is, generally in a procedural statement, 
if you have a user-defined primitive that's a sequential uh, primitive, that's another way. You can assign it with a task or a function. But that's it. You don't. You can't assign a register a value with an, with an assigned statement because those have to be wires. And but you can assign a register in an always block, and you can assign one in an initial block. Those are totally acceptable. So a register cannot be the output of a predefined primitive gate. Only a sequential user-defined primitive. But the predefined, but the primitives that are defined in the uh, in in Vivado itself, uh, as part of its native set, those can a register can never be the outputs. They're always driven. So uh, it cannot be the left-hand side in a continuous assignment statement. The left-hand side in a continuous assignment statement is the output of gates, essentially, or flip-flops. So you, you that wouldn't be a flip-flop because where's the clock, right? So that's a problem. And it cannot be the input or the in-out or bidirectional port of a module port but it can be the output okay so a module can can output from a register but it can't input as a register so if you think about it these make sense uh, because you have to have some kind of idea about when to latch the data in a register all right integer so when you want to do most numeric computations this is the type you will you'll use or you'll use a real Now, these have to be the left side in a procedural statement. And by definition, they're 32 bits. This is a little bit host machine dependent. I guess there are some devices, some uh, integrated development environments for FPGAs where they might be a different size. But on, on in Vivado, they're 32 bits. They are in, they are in, they can be, uh, so they can be unsigned or signed. Uh, but generally, they're two's complement. And uh, and they typically have it. They have a default value of zero. You cannot have you cannot have them at, as data type unknown, and you cannot have them as disconnected. And um, you you can have an array of integers, but you cannot specify a part of an integer. Here are a couple of examples. So integer, A1 and K, and size of memory. So that's three. Integer array of integers, and there's one to 100. So you have 100 of these integers. But no, there's no, there's no bit range specified. So the, so the specification goes on the right side of the variable, not over here on the left side. And you can't specify the lower eight bits or something like that of the integer that that's not allowed all right reals are just what you think they are double precision floating point numbers uh in ieee standard i think they default to 0, 0.0 they cannot be connected to a port or to a primitive so you can't have them a party or you can't pass them to and from a port and uh there are some system tasks that are provided to allow you to, to pass them into a module and get them back from a module or whatever. And that's where you can go from real to bits and bits to real. So you, you have to convert them with these system tasks. And there are limits on what operators you can use with these. Okay. Real time. So this is stored like a real. It's a way to store time as a float. And it's pretty much mostly just used in test benches. Whereas time supports time-related computations. It is an unsigned 64-bit uh, integer, and it can't be used in a module port or a primitive. It defaults to zero, and it's also often used in test benches. All right. OK, so, <clears throat> so we have nets, and there's actually quite a few different ones most of which we've never used so first off wire and try 
So we've pretty much only used wire, but actually try and wire are the same. So you could substitute try wherever you have wire, although if you're dealing with single bits, wire is preferred. But, it, it, but, if, but if you're using a vector, you can use try instead of wired if you want. They're the, the same. The W and and the WR are wire and and wire or. And then the try and and try or And then you also see the tri and and the tri r. And the tri and and the wired and are the same, basically, and the wired r and the tri r are the same. And and the way these work, uh, if if for the wired and and the tri and, if any of the values, it, if it's a vector and any of the values in that vector, and typically it is going to be a vector, because there's no point in using a wired and or a tri and if it's not a vector. Or same for or, wired r and tri r. So when it's a vector, if any of the inputs are zero, then the, then then it will put out a zero. And for the and for the or, if any of the inputs are one, then it'll put out a one for the wired or or tri r. So uh, try zero and try one. These are used to model um, pull ups and pull downs. So so uh, the try zero. Would have pulled that resistive pull downs, and the try one would have resistive pull ups. The supply zero and one basically uh, are used for power supply. Now all these nets have a thing called drive associated with them, and uh, I I haven't really used this, and I don't claim to really understand it exactly. It it it's not so so applicable to the the FPGA world, so that's kind of one of the problems, but. You know, obviously, when you're making a, a dedicated integrated circuit, then that's a little different. And and uh, so I'm not going to say much about that. <clears throat> and then finally, we have the 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 tri reg. And this is kind of the, the, so. In general, nets have no storage capability. The one exception to that is the tri reg. And if the tri reg uh, is is in an is in a high Z state then it retains its previous value. So it actually does have some storage, which is why you see the register part of that name. Um, but it's it's generally not uh, assigned a value in a procedure statement. I, I've never used tri-reg, so it's a little bit of an um, unusual concept. What, it, what it's, uh, it is used to model net capacity. But I'm not even sure I understand what that is. So uh, you should be aware that it's out there and exists. And if you're making the integrated circuits, you might have to get a little smarter about this. But basically, the rest of these, uh, for for dealing with the FPGA world, uh, really wire and try is about all you need. Um, OK. So if a net, if a net is uh, driven, but you don't know what, what the, if, but you know what the value is, then you would assign it an X. But but if it's not driven, then it's going to be high Z, R Z. Okay, so here's how we do tri states, and you should remember this. We get these from a constant. So uh, our constant one tick B Z, that that assigns the value of Z to Y, if uh, the enable is. Uh, So remember, <clears throat> the enable is evaluated, and if it's evaluates true or one, then this is assigned to y. If enable evaluates false, then the one tick b z is assigned to y. Then so if enable is false, y is assigned the value of z or high z state or disconnected. Okay, so some of the common uh, errors for uh, nets and arrays. So uh, let's see, I think this, it, yeah, okay, I'm fine. So, so here we have our variable type, input, output, and in out. So can you be a net variable? Yes, for any of these. Can you be a register variable? Only for the output. So a variable declared as an input to a module it has to be a net. And it's implicitly declared as one. A variable declared as an output from a module can be a net or a register. And a variable cannot be the output 
port uh, are the left-hand side of an assign. Uh, sorry, a register cannot be the output port of a primitive gate or the left-hand side of, it, of a, an assigned statement. Okay. So arrays. So we've talked about arrays before. We'll just kind of touch base on this again. So a one-dimensional array with register elements is called a memory. It represents an array of words, multiple addressable cells of the same size and reference to the word. So for instance, register 31 to 0. So it's that's the higher order bit is 31, lower order bit is 0. Data, and then we have 128 of them going from 0 to 127. So 128 32-bit words. Notice how we go high to low here for the for the bits within the word because we want to specify this is higher order. But, but often we want to organize our array counting from 0 to the maximum number. You don't have to do it. It really wouldn't make that much difference, but it's, it's just logically how we typically think about these things. All right. So here we have a, uh, an array, a two-dimensional array of 32-bit words. And it's 128 by 128. So that's pretty good size. OK, um, so you have your keyword register, your word size, your variable name, and then your multi-dimensions. Now, if you want to reference a single bit in a vector, we call that a bit select. And if you want to, if you want to do the like the low nibble of word 25, we, we call that a part select. So we have bit select and part select. So here's our array. It's, an, it's a register. It's a, called array. It has 8-bit words, and there's 128 of them. And you, if you just want the low nibble of uh, word 25, then you would go array 25, 3 to 0. And that would be a part select. Remember, bit select for single bit, part select for a, a group of bits within a word. And, the, and the, the, group, the part select can be in ascending or descending order, but it has to be the same as the vector. So here are some examples of part select. They must be continuous bits. They have to go from a start bit plus or minus a width. This gets a little tricky. I, I personally think it's better just to specify the bits uh, like this, 3 to 0. Uh, but you can use this start bit plus or minus a width. But I, I, I just don't recommend it. I think it's very easy to get confused about this. So I'm not going to spend a little bit of time talking, but you can use this. And um, so, for instance, logic 31 to 0, A vector, logic 0 to 31, B vector. I don't know. Anyway, I, I'm not even, I think I'm going to skip this. So scope of variables. So just like in C, when a variable comes into existence, it, it exists within a scope. Now, usually in C, uh, we like to try and restrict our variables to the function that they're used in. And But in C, we have global variables, uh, even though we're discouraged from using them in C. And the reason for that is it's real easy if you have global variables to mess with it in two different places and forget that you messed with it in one of the places. And then you won't figure out how come you've got problems with it. Whereas if you keep the scope just within a single function always, then it actually tends to work a whole lot better. Um, so within Verilog, the scope can be within a module, within a task, within a function, or within a named procedural block if, if it's declared in that named procedural block between the beginning and the end. Port declarations. So here's, a, here's an example. You can do it like this. You can say, and we've talked about this already, but maybe not officially. So we can, if you ha add underscore 16, so a 16-bit adder, sum, C out, A, B, and C in. And then 
you put all this in parentheses up here with a semicolon at the end, and then you define them. Output register 15 to 0 for sum. Output register C out, single bit register. Input wire 15 to 0 for A and B, and an input wire for carry in, single bit. You could do try here would be fine too if you want to use that. And then here's another way to define the same thing. You do it all in it within in the parentheses and you exp you define them as outputs and you give all the names and then finally close parenthesis semicolon. And these are just separated by commas. And here you can have two of them on the same line if you want. All right, I think that pretty well covers what I wanted to cover. Um, and um, so, again, uh, I think what I am going to do for the uh, what I'm going to do for the for the for the the written two test, which comes up on the 13th, I, I'm I'm going to base it around a carry look ahead and carry propagate adders compared to carry ripple adders, and so you might spend a little time brushing up on that. But I will specifically review that, and I'll try and. I'll try and highlight the, the things I'd like you to know. Uh, and I'm probably just going to give you some, some code uh, and then have you answer questions about that code. Uh, that's, that's what I'm thinking. I'm not going to have you write code. Uh, so that's kind of how it's going to go down. And I may make it a fairly short test. I, I don't think it's going to be a super long one. Maybe 20 questions kind of tops. Uh, and I'll probably weight it a little less than the first test. Uh, but it'll, it'll carry some weight, and hopefully you'll do great on this, and you'll be fine. All right, we will, uh, we will see you then. Uh, I'll do a little video for Friday um, and probably talk about uh, some of these other optional topics. And, but I will, I will review some for the test on Friday. Hopefully I'll begin to have an idea of what I'm going to cover then. All right, that should do it.